وعيد بن عقدة من لسان الفقه القومي. Usually I give a lecture about the Ten Commandments that I came up with that Muslims should be aware of when it comes to American laws. But today the focus will be one or two of them since we have the events in Gaza and falling. And I think one of the sisters from CARE was here before me and may Allah reward them for the good and excellent work that they have been doing as an organization. Uh, and we need to make dua for them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everybody who speaks up and who says that this is wrong, what's happening in Gaza is wrong. So with that being said, I start always my presentation with a statement of Hudayf ibn al-Yaman when he said, كان الناس يسألون النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عن الخير فيأتون وكنت أسأله عن الشر مخافة أن يدركني The translation is that the people, the Sahaba of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to ask him about good deeds to bring them closer to Allah as for me, I used to ask him about bad or evil things, so I do not commit them. I do not fall in their traps. And there is a qaida fiqhiyya in our jurisprudence or fiqh, taqul, dar al mafasid muqaddam ala jalb al masalih. Or in English, to stay away from evil and bad things takes precedence over bringing benefit to yourself or to the community. So meaning, stay away from problems is better than doing good things or bringing benefit. Because bringing benefit will benefit you and others, but if you do something and you land in legal trouble, we know what happens, especially if you are Muslim. Because we are the most, unfortunately, this is a reality, even though this is a, a country of laws, Muslims are the most heavily targeted and surveilled community in the United States. Whether we like it or not, whether we admit it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, it is true, based on statistics that I can go over them because of the constraints of time. I'm gonna mention the 10 commandments just to give you an idea, and then I'll focus on the First, first Amendment, because that's the topic of today's uh, lecture, basically. The first advice, and Sheikh Wahaj said it right after Isha, that some of us, especially in tax seasons, we get phone calls and someone say, I am, you know, from IRS, employee ID number to give himself like a former government title, ID number 3467 and you owe us $10,000 and if you do not pay them within the next, within the next two, three hours, we have two policemen or FBI agents who will come and arrest you at home. And they know your address, they know your date of birth, and sometimes they know your social security number. Wallahi, it happened with five people whom I know personally. And they, they came to me when I was in Michigan after the fact that they paid 10000 or 15000 dollars to these guys. And they walked them through the whole process, went to the bank, and they paid the money, and they came to the lawyer. No lawyer will benefit you, no judge, no senator, no nothing. Just make dua and say, that's all. And most of them were from Yemen, and I'm not taking, I'm not trained, I love Yemen brothers like everybody else, if not more. But, you know, that's just a lesson for 
So IRS, Medicare, Social Security Administration, they never call you, they never text you, they never sent you like an email. The only thing they do is send you a letter and you have time to respond as required by due process or the law in general that you have to have a notice that you owe someone something and a hearing or a time to be heard whether in writing or you go to court. Well, saying number one is never bother. If someone call you a number that you don't recognize, hang up with them. We have a court judgment against you. You have to pay us this. You owe us this. Hang up with them. Don't even listen to what they say. They never ever email or text, text or send you an email. They only write a letter to your address. Number two is law enforcement. And we, we're going to come and cover this later on. Law enforcement have the right to contact you. So the other guys, they are scam. Government impersonators, they call them scams. So don't listen to them, you know, hang up with them. What if you are contacted by a law enforcement? Whether it's an FBI agent, whether it's a police, local police, state police, municipality or city police, what you should do? Absent a court order, you have no obligation to cooperate with them or give them any information about yourself or anybody else. So basically, you cannot hang up on them, obviously, but you can say, if they want to meet with you, don't meet with them. Unless you have an attorney or care or someone else you know and trust that can talk to them. Oftentimes, have been with me like 10 times before, when I call them and I say, I'm calling with regards to this person, they never call back. But sometimes they do. So you ask them whether my client is a target, is the target of the investigation, or is he a person of interest, or is he a witness? There's a huge difference between the three. That's not the time to talk about it. We can talk about it in a different, uh, you know, lecture or presentation or discussion. So this is what's saying number two, that when you are contacted with any law enforcement, doesn't matter what it is, don't talk to them without a lawyer or an organization you trust be present with you. Number two about this, sometimes they try to trick you saying, it's only like a few questions. We want to hear your views on what's going on in Gaza now. You're not the diplomat, you're not a politician. And they may ask you questions that you implicate yourself and be in trouble with the law. So don't talk to them without an attorney or someone or some organization, and there are many alhamdulillah now, to be with you present at the time that you are interviewed because there are some questions that you don't have to answer them. That some questions you don't have to answer because you could incriminate or implicate yourself and you don't want to do that. So law enforcement absent a court order, don't talk to them. But say, give me your business card. But more important than all this, never ever give consent to a law enforcement to come to your house. Never ever. Give them your lawyer's number, your organization's number, and meet with them at the law office or at the organization's office. Do not give consent to any law enforcement to come to your house. Because anything they could see or smell in plain view, plain smell, they can use it against you. Some of us say, some people told me that I want to give them dawah. No, don't give them that. I want to show them the Arab hospitality, you know, you know, Fahsa, whatever you call, I mean, biryani in the case of brothers from Pakistan and India. So that's not the time to feed them. They will never even drink a sip of water from your house, but they are up there because they need something. Either you are a target, of course you never meet them in the first place, 
person of interest, which means that you know a lot about the target, but you're not the target. A witness, your name or phone number came out, out of the blue, and they want to ask you, do you know that person who was the target of the investigation? Make a long story short, don't talk to them, don't meet with them by yourself, but make sure you have an attorney present or an organization and tell them whatever, ask them before we meet what is the purpose of the interview. If it is you are the target, you never meet with them. You have to have a lawyer and then the lawyer will go through the process. Um, number three, and then I will elaborate on it because it's very pertinent and very relevant to what's happening now. And I forgot in the very beginning to, uh, there's a disclaimer that I have to say, I am an attorney with the Department of Defense, the Pentagon. So whatever I say today, they are all my own opinions. They do not reflect the Pentagon or the Department of Defense or the US government. I speak as Sayyid Mustafa of Michigan. Nothing more. As an attorney, yes, but not for the government. I speak as a person now. And I share it with you for Mbab al Nasiha. Nothing more. I'm not here to get business from you. And you know me for more than 20 years, some of you, alhamdulillah. So, number three is the one that we're gonna focus much more than anything else. Be careful on what you post on social media. Because there are, and I'm, I'm sharing this with you, Hamas is designated by the United States government since 1997 as a foreign terrorist organization. No matter how we think of Hamas as Muslims, the position of the US government is that Hamas is a foreign terrorist organization, like Hezbollah, like Al-Qaeda, like all these organizations. How does this process happen? Very briefly, the Secretary of State designate an organization with, in consul, consultation with the Secretary of Defense and the Attorney General, and he designates a given organization as being a foreign terrorist organization. Then he sent like an opinion or an outline why he wants to designate that organization as a foreign terrorist organization and send it to Congress. For seven days, if he doesn't hear anything from Congress, he designates, he has the authority, the Secretary of State, to designate an organization as a foreign terrorist organization. Why I'm saying that? It must be a foreign, it, it must be a terrorist organization or basically engaged in terrorism in the eyes of the United States government. The reason I'm saying that, because any providing material support to an organization which has been designated by the Secretary of State as a foreign terrorist organization, you could be charged with providing material support to a terrorist organization, which means, I remember a case that I was a consultant on like 12 years ago in Boston, where a pharmacist translated a book, which is called The 39 Ways of Performing Jihad. And he translated it, downloaded it, and sent it to everybody, shared it with everybody that knew. One person overseas whose English was his native language, he used that book to carry out some illegal, unlawful terrorist, whatever you call it, activities against some American targets or interests overseas. That person in Boston was charged with providing material support for that organization. And the jury said, but for him translating that book, that guy overseas would not have attacked the US base of tent uh, interest 
and he got 17 years in prison for providing material support for a foreign terrorist organization. So please be careful when you post something pro Hamas. I would not, I would never do that. Make as many dua as you want to the brothers and sisters in Gaza and Palestine and all that. We all do that. We all believe that this is wrong. This is genocide. Even that some Americans now and the UN and a lot of international human rights organizations consider what's happening in Gaza now, not just Muslims, as a genocide, as wrong, as a collective punishment, as all of the above. Right? So you can say whatever you want, your opinion, you cannot be punished as per the First Amendment, First Amendment for saying, I think what's happening in Gaza is a genocide. What's happening in Gaza is whatever. I criticize the American blind support for Israel. You can say all that. Freedom of speech is one of the freedoms that the First Amendment, the First Amendment guarantees for us. Speech, suppression, assembly, peacefully obviously, but as long as going to march, rallies, demonstrations, say whatever you want, unless the exception is do not, do not make threats. Do not incite others to do acts of violence. And do not be like aggressive when we did the march or the demonstration rally in Detroit two weeks ago, I think, less than two weeks ago, and some brothers and sisters, when they came to Starbucks, you know, they were like, some of them wanted to go literally, and, and, and I was like, please don't do that. Just say whatever you want. Do nothing violent because you're going to be arrested, the least of which would be disorderly conduct or destruction of property. So when we talk about, I'm not gonna go to the other uh, wasaya, uh, wasaya, but I'm gonna focus on this because this is a topic of the hour now. So say what you want to say. Don't make threats. Don't incite others to do any violent act. Don't say any support statements for Hamas because it could be interpreted or misinterpreted as providing material support. Translating a book was considered to be providing material support. He didn't have the intention, what we lawyers call the mens rea or the guilty mind, or acts rea even, that the act itself, he didn't mean by translating it, or he didn't expect or assume that someone overseas will do something wrong, but it did happen, and he paid a heavy price, 17 years in prison, for translating a book and downloading it and sharing it. If you get any video that you're not sure about, don't open it. If you open it and you watch it, don't share it. I had some friends, and now there's a, like a lot of people post a lot of things that I would never share it with nobody. like. You know, Qatar al-Qassam is, a, you know, hunting Israeli tanks and all that, and they're saying Allah Akbar. We never know what they will come back and do. They can make cases like after 9-11, 330 cases, the FBI hired 150 handlers or informants, send them to the massage, and just say, what do you think of Osama bin Laden? So some people, oh, he's a great hero, he's like this and this and that. They would take that guy and then go to his house, send the informant. We have brothers and sisters in, 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 in Iraq who are, you know, attacked and, and harmed by the American troops. So let's go there and fight them. Oh, let's go. And they never went. And they got convicted in court in Ohio, Toledo. And the first one got 20 years in prison. 
Second one got 17 years in prison. The third one got 15 years in prison because the jury, when we asked them, why did you convict my client? Because he said he's willing to go to Iraq and fight the American troops. He never went to Iraq. He never left America, let alone going to Iraq and fighting. And one of them went to Jordan, and he said, I am here to see my family who's from Jordan. And the guy is an FBI informant, informant, and he took his phone, the informant's phone, and said, this is the FBI phone. Take it and call your relatives in America. It's free. It's paid by, by the FBI. And yet he got 20 years in prison. So they can come back and, and I'm not trying to scare you or anything. I'm giving you real life examples that sometimes you do minor things and it comes and bite us. So say what you want to say. I'm not saying don't say anything. Even if it's controversial, like you say, I think that, you know, the American troops, the, the American blind support is wrong 100%. In America, this is controversial. You, they cannot punish you for this. They cannot take you to court for this. You cannot, they cannot take you to court for participating in a march or a rally or a demonstration. No. But only if you incite others to do something illegal or unlawful or to destroy property, only then you are in trouble. You could be in trouble. So when it comes to freedom of speech, we have home, we have work, we have school, we have, what else? Demonstration we covered. Home, your home is your palace. You can talk about everything you want, anything you want. Nobody will listen to you or, you know, spy on you when you say that, unless you're watching 1984 and Big Brother is watching you all over. That that's, doesn't happen to the best of my knowledge. I, I don't know much about that. So, at home, your home, nobody can come to your home without your consent, and never ever give consent to nobody. If Joe Biden come and say, I want to drink tea with you, don't let him in. Never know, okay? If anybody comes and say, I want a few minutes, it's one question, I want to hear your boy, you know, views on this, no. Talk to my lawyer, or talk to my organization, whatever you want. Never ever give consent, never incite others to do anything, never make threats. But at home, you expect what we call private, you know, privacy, and nobody can invade your privacy at home. Your home is your palace. You can say whatever you want, or do whatever you want, at home. Let's take it a step further. They used to, in law school, give us an example. It's not the best example I, I can say, but, <laughs> used to say it all the time when you have each one of us has like a garbage day they pick up the trash right so they say your garbage when it is in your house in your garage it's yours the minute you put it outside right by the you know the mailbox or whatever it is on the grass outside your property that's that's the city street there's no expectation of privacy anymore so if you have anything that you don't want anybody to look at, that's not yours anymore. You could be prosecuted for this. So be careful about paperwork and all this, shred them, whatever it is. If you're reading something you think it's questionable or suspicious, just shred it. If you print it, obviously I wouldn't print it on something like that. So at home, the minute you get out of your house, there is no expectation of privacy. Anything is subject to being inspected, examined, and assessed or evaluated by the law enforcement. Never ever give consent to any law enforcement. Again and again, I said it like three, four times now, because they are not there to help you or to listen to your views or your side of the story. They come and saying that. You don't have to talk to them. Be nice to them. Don't say, you're coming to me because I am Muslim. You're coming to me because I am brown. You're coming to me because I am this, I'm black, I'm this. No. Okay. Uh, I have a lawyer, he will call you. I have an organization who will call you. 
It's, it's just one question. We, we don't have to have a lawyer. No, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, I got your business card, I got your number, your phone number, your name, and I have my lawyer uh, come to you. So don't be intimidated when they come. When they come to people, there are always two, one to ask questions, one to take notes, and you know, they put it in what we call the 302 form, which is uh, FBI statements, and they can use it against you. But if you talk to them with a lawyer or organization present, never ever lie to them. They can legally lie to you, but you can never lie to them. Don't ever lie to them. And don't give a, a level. What, what, when I did this before I moved to Washington, at least, I, I didn't move physically to Washington, but I worked from home, but I go to Washington once a month, at least 10 days. So when I was in Michigan, like full time, if you will, I would prep my clients before interviewing with the FBI, and I say short and sweet, don't lie, tell the truth. If you know the answer, say I know. If you don't know, say I don't know. It's not a crime to say I don't know. Then the first question, I drive me crazy when I prep them and all this and this, and then the first question, what's your name? Then the answer comes here or back home. And I'm like, how many names do you have? What's your date of birth, here or back home? I said, it's only one, whatever is in your driver license. How, are you married? Yes. How many wives do you have? And I say, well, why this question, my brother? So yeah, I'm just asking him a question. You say, okay, so here or back home again? I'm like, answer the question, man. Go, just say, my name is so-and-so, my date of birth here. Whatever you go by here, say that. Because sometimes they forget about the topic and you become the target of them now that you have something. And last year, in fact, two years ago, the State Department started investigating Yemenis who came under different names than their own names. And they won during Trump. And of course, Trump, Trump even tried to take some, they naturalized some people who had US citizenship because they had allegedly fake, Trump fake, allegedly uh, links to terrorist organizations. Five of them, but alhamdulillah, they were, you know, the Court of Appeals refused that. They, 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 they reversed that. So, alhamdulillah. So, back to what I was saying. So, home, we have no outside your house restrictions a little bit. And then at work. It depends on whether you work for an organization or an agency, federal, state, government, then you can say whatever you want. You can wear whatever you want. If you want to say free, free Palestine shirt, then you wear it, or your Ikfia, or whatever you want to wear. They cannot prevent you from that. You can say what you want, your opinion. They cannot punish you for this. But if you work for a private company, they can discipline you for not following their public policy. So if they say for them, we support Israel, and you say the other way around, they can discipline you because it's a private company. But a public or government, government could be state, municipality, like federal government, they cannot discipline you or punish you for saying your opinion, even if it does not agree with their, their, their main opinion or public policy. What about school? I think there was a sister from CARE, and they have much, much more experience than myself about that. But generally speaking, the same thing applies, except if you are in a private school. Again, private school, they can discipline you if you say or make a statement against their public policy. But if it's a taxpayer public school, you have more rights to say, don't do nothing. Unless you, if you disrupt the class, they can discipline you. If you say something and it sounds like you're making threats, they can discipline you either public or private, right? 
but you can say anything even if it's controversial or it is not in line with the opinion or the public policy of the public schools. But private schools, they can discipline you if they say something against their school policy. Uh, uh, the, I will stop here, in fact, to take some questions, and then if not questions, then I will continue with, but I think I covered the fr freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly. If you are home, if you're at school, if you are at work, if you are on the street, and I don't think I missed anything else. At least that, that, that part of the wasiya. And then I will open the floor for questions. If not, then I'll continue with the other uh, advice that I have for the Muslim community that I do it, alhamdulillah, everywhere. Uh, for the sake of Allah, not to get business, not for anything else. So, any questions or shall I move on? Move on? Yes, please. Uh, can you can you speak up, please? Because you made you said you you made care, you said care. Yes. Yes. Uh, there are ACLU. They are very very good. I have not heard what they said about the conflict in Gaza now, because some of the leadership are Jewish. But one thing we all learn, and we are in the masjid, in the bait of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an extension of the mission of Allah, and sometimes they pray here, we pray here too. So I can say without reservation, one of the things that we as Muslims here in Farmington Hills and everywhere else in the world, that not all Jews are bad. We should not stereotype or generalize with nobody because some of them made a stand that some of us as Muslims and Arabs in the Arab world especially, shamefully, I'm saying that being myself an Arab, being myself an Egyptian, which did not move a finger to help their neighbors, Palestinian brothers and sisters. So what we have seen all of us, whether it's not in our name, Law professors from Harvard, 80 years old, knowing that they will be arrested for disorderly conduct. And they proudly came and say, Judaism does not support or sponsor what the Zionists are doing. I, 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 well, I, I, I was in tears. When I saw a lady, 80 years old, she can hardly talk, and she's a professor from Harvard, and she said, I am here to express my dis it's disgusting, it's inhumane, it's wrong, it's un-Jewish to do that. And thousands of people. And they knew that they would be arrested, and they were arrested for disorderly conduct at Penn Station. Yes? How you say it? You, you say I cannot talk to you. I have to have someone present with me. It could be a friend. It could be a lawyer. It could be an organization. They cannot force them, themselves on you. They cannot force you to be interviewed. They have no right. Absent a court order, judge's order signed by the judge, they, you have no obligation to talk to them or help them or cooperate with them. That's the law. Police, FBI, anybody. So you say, I will contact you or someone on my behalf will contact you. I don't have time now. I am sorry. I would love to talk to you, but I can't talk to you. So be nice. Don't be aggressive and say, why are you talking to me? Because my name is Sayyid Mustafa and I am Muslim, I'm Arab, I'm whatever, or Pakistani, or whatever, Afghani. I don't want to exclude anybody, so. and you are family to me, so I'm saying that. What was the question? 
the question is what the question if I um, said it right what if what shall I say if they say like we want to meet with you and and I don't I, I don't want to basically offend them or say no I'm, I don't want to talk to them no you, do, you don't have to feel that way you don't have to talk to them and that should be in your mind if they know you know your rights they will realize and I told you oftentimes they don't call back if a lawyer organization or a friend doesn't have to be a lawyer but of course getting a lawyer he knows what questions he would object to and he would ask them why do you want to interview this person and not anybody else because I had a, a sister Indian sister who sent an email to a scholar who was like labeled as a terrorist overseas and she sent him an email seven years ago and she said in our religion we are commanded to, to do hijrah to immigrate like the Prophet did right so how can I do that now I'm in America I'm settled do I still have to do hijrah legitimate question I mean there's nothing wrong with that she's not saying jihad she's saying hijrah like is it the prophet all prophets made hijrah right we know that these are prophets for, for a purpose if you are happy if you're settled so why anyways but the name of the person which I cannot disclose the, the, the scholar I'm not talking about the sister obviously confidentiality or never did that that sh that shape was assassinated by the Americans later on okay so his name was like another UBL you know so they came to her and they insisted to interview her and sh she called me she was like friend she was like freaking out he said give them the phone and talk to them here is a lawyer talking no we don't we want to talk to you so I said tell them I have a lawyer give me your business card and he will talk to you I met with them and I asked them the same questions that we always ask and then after that they said she never sent any other email I explained to them I am Muslim and part of our religion is we ask scholars that whether we should do this or this is for fatwa she happened she didn't know that 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 she was you know under watch from the US government and she didn't know and then they, asked, they said we'll ask her a few questions and we're done they asked her a few questions I objected to some questions and then it was gone I never called her again but when they they appear at your house or just whatever you, they meet you you freak out no matter who you are you freak out just the word FBI or police or makes you freak out especially the pubs like myself and you guys some of us mashallah we have pubs a lot of pubs here including myself but like back home authority police you're in trouble you're like you freak out some people cry they break down just relax whatever happens online is in Allah's hands but be careful and be wise yes brother I'm sorry did I answer your question you mentioned that uh, we can do peaceful demonstrations yes having said that there are lots of demonstrations that are happening in the universities yes and the universities are taking action on them and at the same time president trump has been saying that he's going to pay or he's going to be poor president trump president trump in his rallies has been saying you, you mean president biden Oh, you're talking about Sorry, before. Trump, Trump, yeah. President Trump. Oh, okay. He's, yeah. he's been saying that he's going to deport and, you know, he's going yes. to deport the citizens and whoever is taking part in the. Right. Uh, then how does our amendment, the First Amendment, come into picture here? Okay. The First Amendment, I mean, let me just clarify one thing. I did immigration law for 20 years, removal and deportation. Nobody, Biden, Trump, no president can deport anybody. There is a process, a very lengthy process, that they have ICE, Immigration Customs and Enforcement, has to put you through removal or deportation process. 
and you have the right to have a lawyer to defend you and to say he is not deportable, he is not removable. For that, following reasons. Trump said, if you have any links to terrorist organizations, then we can deport you, or if you are a US citizen, we can take the citizenship away from you. We can denaturalize you, like they say. And so the First Amendment, you can say whatever you want, if you are a permanent resident, or if you are a US citizen, right? The only person who can deport you, and I'm talking about permanent residents, is the immigration judge. And you still can up appeal to the BIA, the Bureau of Appeal, Immigration Appeals. So it's not easy to deport anybody, remove anybody from the United States, let alone someone who's exercising his or her First Amendment rights. So it's, it's, it's unheard of. I never seen any cases that someone was deported because they said something bad or not acceptable or even violent, that inciting. That's a different story. Could be in jail if something happens, okay? But or aiding and abetting someone else to do something wrong. So that's a very lengthy process. Only immigration judge can deport or remove someone from the United States. No, one, no president can do that. It's only with the court system, judiciary. What about for students? What about? What about for the students? Students have F1 visa. Of course, it's different. Uh, students, it's a non-immigrant visa. Any non-immigrant visa, like B1, B2, like F1, uh, K1, until they come, uh, these are all what we call immigration practitioners, non-immigrant visas. They can be deported easily, unlike permanent resident or citizen. Citizen, forget about it. Permanent resident means green card holder or permanent resident. They, the government has to prove that he violated immigration laws or any laws and he will pose a threat to the American US national security. And this is very, very, very hard to prove in court, in immigration court. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're okay. Any other questions? Yes, bro. Brother, this might sound funny, but maybe it would be better For some reason, I can't hear you even. I'm getting old, or I, I need a hearing aid. <laughs> Do you, do you want to take that? No, I, I, maybe you yeah. can just repeat the question. Okay. Might sound funny. Is there a specific time that these officers can show up? Or is it like 9 to 5 is when we need to be careful? Because I usually work away from home. And I have, I'm, I'm worried because of the current situation. So is there a time that I need to be monitoring, calling the family? Calling your family? Just call the family and check if everything is fine. Calling your family where? Home. Here. Because I work away from home. Okay. Based on your experience, when when do they usually show up? If no, show there up, is no time for them to show up. There is no. They can. It depends whether it is. I hate uh, you're standing and I'm I'm sitting. Um, it depends if it is what we call adjustment of status. Like if someone. This is separate from what you're saying, but I'm giving you an example. A uh, husband is married to a U.S. citizen, and ICE, which is like the FBI of immigration, they do what we call on-site visits, an inspection, like an inspection, like, you know, massage and all that, when they apply for an email, right? So they come 6 a.m., 7 a.m., to make sure the husband and wife at the house. And they can come, nobody can tell them you need a search warrant or a search warrant. They don't need a search warrant. That's the only exception. Back to your question. This is, a, this is totally different from what you said. Yeah. If the FBI, they need to talk to you, and they have reached out to a lot of Muslims saying, we want to know what's your view on what's happening in Gaza. And the first question, 
as we all expect the question to be is, do you condemn what Hamas did on the 7th of October? So basically, they are throwing it at us, making us defensive. So I'll answer your question first and then come to this. So there is no specific times. They can come anytime, but usually they come during the day. Okay, to make sure, sometimes they come after five because everybody's working. So if they come home and they knock at the door for the sisters, don't open the door. Unless they have a court order and then tell you we have a court order, don't open the door. My husband is not here. Very simple. We need to talk. They talk to you through the door. We want to talk. I am not that person. If you're not, who is he? I don't know if he's your husband. Yes, my husband, but he's not home. You can leave your car and then make sure he calls you or someone else will call you. That's it. But there is no specific time. They usually come after five when everybody comes home from work. I go back to what I was saying. Go ahead. If they have a court order, then you can tell them that I will talk in front of that person. No, if they have a court order, that's different. Court order could mean judge order. Or um, search warrant or arrest warrant and you have no choice you can hire fighter he cannot be with you he cannot do you nothing you know a court order comes after a police officer FBI agent writes an affidavit or declaration detail that we have been investigating that person watching him he's doing a lot of things and we have witnesses who will come and testify before a grand jury that this person is a suspect, right? So the judge, after listening to the agent or the officer, signs the search warrant or the arrest warrant, okay? Once they have that, you look at it, your name should be correct, your address should be correct, and the property that they want to search, if it's a search, search warrant. Is it the whole house? Is it one room? If it's an arrest warrant, then you have to turn yourself. Don't, don't resist them, because this is another charge that they can say, you know, they are you know, resisting uh, arresting officers. So it will be worse for you. Absent court orders, whether it's a search warrant or an arrest warrant, you don't have to talk to them, you don't have to open the door, you don't have to do nothing, basically. Leave your car, I'll have my husband or my lawyer, or whatever, call you. And that's about it, that's the end of it. Any other, yes, Dr. Khan. Very good. Uh, the question is, what? how can we support financially the brothers of Gaza or sisters of Gaza? Any organization incorporated in the United States under U.S. laws is eligible to receive money to send to any country that designated with that organization. No foreign, no foreign, no online donation, no foreign organization even if they are legitimate. No Canadian, and I know Canadian, I'm talking about Gaza only. If it's Gaza, it's better to be an organization incorporated anywhere in the United States. That's fine, you have no problem. And you can even say in the memo for Gaza, because they are victims. Everybody in the world, including a lot of Americans now, SubhanAllah. They say it's not self-defense. We all agree on this. It's way, way beyond. It's a genocide. It's a collective punishment. It's a ethnic cleansing. 15,000 people got killed so far. 35,000 got injured. And uh, people who are like under the rubble, we don't know how many, how many thousands more. So there's nothing wrong to donate to an organization incorporated in the U.S. under U.S. laws. Any other questions? 
Okay, so I have to go in here because I have to pick up my daughter from Unity Center. Um, she's in the girls' group and they finish at 9, unless we have any other questions. Last question. Last question. That's a very, yes, I did not answer this question. That's a very good uh, point. Uh, we asked him, you still, he's like having a grudge against me, brother, brother Bushdi. <laughs> For something happened today. Uh, so I will answer that question. Remember what I said before, and don't get me wrong, what's the question? If you are asked, and if you want to answer, you don't have to answer, right? We said that, you don't have to answer. If somebody asks you a question, I keep my views to myself. But if you felt you want to answer the question, you say, my religion is Islam, I am Muslim. Of course, they know we are Muslims. And my religion prohibits, forbids killing of any civilian innocent people. Okay? Did I answer your question? No. Whether they are, yes, I do. But I condemn more what's happening to Palestinians in Gaza. Because if you said I don't con condemn it, they might interpret it as you are like, what, you're, you're, you're pro Hamas, you're this, you're this, you're that. I, if, if someone else, if another attorney would say, no, I don't condemn that, I wouldn't go with that route. Right. But you wouldn't say you would condemn it. You condemn it. I would. I prefer not to say anything. Say, I keep my views to myself. I feel sorry for that 15,000 people have been killed in Gaza and nobody moved a finger in the world, including our country already, that we pay taxes for. You can say that. Uh, but say Hamas doesn't merit a terrorist organization. Aren't you supposed to go along with the laws? Aren't you supposed to go along with what? The laws. Like the yeah, you. By saying what I said now, I didn't go against the law. I didn't say that I approve. We would never say, make dua for Hamas. Of course not. You cannot say this out loud. Right? On public. So, you can say, I condemn what happened on 7, October 7th, but I also condemn what has been happening. And I'm sorry for the Israeli loss and all this, but we're talking about 1,400 versus 15,000, 5,000 ch children, and 4,900 uh, women, and 35,000 like injured, some critical conditions. So you have to give them both. both. There is nothing wrong with that, Islamic or otherwise. Now we have to shift. Say it again, I didn't hear you. You said your house is your castle, but how about the phone inside the house? That, we're, you, we're not, I mean, I don't think they are they're like bugging your phone at home. And this is freedom of speech as well. But you're not going to say Allah, Mansur, Hamas, Allah, you cannot say no, that. I'm not talking about Hamas, I'm just talking like the phone. Yes, we have to be very careful when we talk with others because we don't know whether our phone are, you know, intercepted by someone else or not. But what I am saying is, the law gives us a lot of freedoms. And we can use it wisely and legally, without making threats, without saying things that we will regret later on. So the, the, the rule is very, very clear. As long as you don't incite, you don't make threats, you don't say something aggressive, or hostile, you're, you're fine. You can say anything controversial. In my opinion, Israel is, uh, is uh, the, you know, you're talking about terrorism, Israel is, uh, what Israel is doing now is terrorism. You can say that. Nobody will, will take you to jail for that. I hope not. <laughs> I'm sorry? If you want to abstain yourself, let's say they showed up on my doorstep, right? If you want to? If you, you don't want to say to answer the questions, right? That's what you say. Yeah, so don't answer the question. I I said it more than five times. You do not absent a court order. You don't have to cooperate with any law enforcement. They will ask you to, to 
for a signature? Hmm? Will they ask for the signature that I am abstain and not able to vote? No, signature for what? They, well, what's, they cannot write anything. You didn't say anything. They cannot, you have to sit down with you and do the 302 and then, you know, and don't lie to them. If you choose to talk to them, never ever lie. Short and sweet answer. Not back home or here, not my name here and there. there. Yes, that will be the last question, inshallah, because I have to go. I'm sorry, the social media and the phone? If you talk on the phone about Hamas and all those things. So I would not mention Hamas on any phone call. Never. Okay. Never okay. even. Look what Hamas did today. Oh, I'm proud of them. Of course not. I would never say that. Are they catching the hmm? Is there any clue that they are catching the phone for a normal public? They can do for national security purposes. There's something called the uh, SIPA. It gives them the right to uh, to buy some phones. And do they need a court order? Legally, yes, but they can do it. So I would be very careful what I say. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at here, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Allahumma khfil lana dhubana wa sarafana fi amrina wa thamit aqdamana wa sumna ala qawmi kafirin. Allahumma kullu aqwanina fi ghazza wa bal alameen. Allahumma msumu ya rabbi. اللهم صل على النصر من عندك يا كريم اللهم تقبل موتهم الشهداء يا رب العالمين واشف مرضاهم وجرحاهم دوهم يا رب العالمين اللهم ارحم كبل الامهات الثكالى والاطفال اليتامى في غزه يا رب العالمين ربنا اننا خذلناهم فانصرهم اللهم انا خذلناهم فانصرهم يا رب العالمين ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا انك انت التواب الرحيم ونجينا واهلنا والمسلمين جميعا خصوصا في غزه وفلسطين من الهم والكم والغرب والكم والكرب العظيم واجعل عبادتنا خالصه بالوجه الكريم والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله. Thank you very good.